Oh, this is going to be exciting. I can't wait to get into this, so let's pray and begin. Precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you. This is the day that you've made. We're rejoicing. We're glad in it. And Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach this episode, Father God, this truth of yours. Our lives won't be the same as we have your precious Holy Spirit on assignment, revealing the Word, unfolding it, implanting it in our hearts so that, Lord, it brings forth good fruit, lasting fruit in Jesus. Jesus, precious name, amen. All right, we're on No Fear Here, part two. No Fear Here. This is so exciting, so good. It's life producing. That's what it is. It's life producing. In part one, we discover from God's word that he's not, God's not a deceiver or a fear tormenting God. Yes, he makes the demons shake and quake. That's a good thing. Devils are terrified of God's presence. That's a good thing. But God's family should trust and run into his presence, hide in God's presence, find extreme comfort, solace, peace, and a refuge in God's presence under his wings of mercy. Did you know that God says, even to the sinner, he says, come, let's reason. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. God is a God to run to, not from. God never uses fear as a tactic to direct or control you. That's the devil's MO. God wants your loyalty, your trust in him, your choice for him, your love in him. Satan just wants you paralyzed in fear, tormented in self-destruct mode, permanently silencing your faith. Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, the great French military commander and emperor, he once said this, the world suffers a lot, not because of the violence of bad people, but because of the silence of good people. You see, the absence, the vacuum of faith-filled people speaking God's will here on earth is the terrible outcome of the influence of fear. And this is why fear has birthed so much tragedy and terror on planet earth. 2 Timothy 1.7, we quoted this in part one, but I want you to hear it again right from the onset of this segment. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Let me say it again. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but what? But of power and of love and of a sound mind. God wants you to have a sound mind. There was a professional football game going on and a doctor working the first aid station, he had several people come in with what he determined to be food poisoning. It was so bad, he felt obligated to warn the crowd. So they announced during a break that there was a concern of food poisoning at a concession stand. Well, suddenly, the doctor had over 200 sick people, some so severe that they had to be taken to the hospital. After further investigation, check this out, they realized the food poisoning actually came from a concession stand, not at the game, but at an unrelated food stand from across town. They announced this to the stadium and to those already transferred to the hospitals. Well, suddenly, if you can imagine, Everyone instantly got cured. Symptoms disappeared miraculously, and people even checked out of the hospital. Fear had so overtaken the crowd's attitude, their thinking and their beliefs for an outcome for food poisoning. They believed they had food poisoning, and all the symptoms showed up. The suggestion everyone was sick, and suddenly the outcome was everybody felt sick. The devil has one million suggestions for you, and not one of them will give you power, love, or a sound mind. Not one of them. He's a deceiver and a destroyer. You must determine to say, no fear here. No fear here. So let me give you seven fast Bible truths about fear. Here we go. Number one, fear is never from God. Worry, anxiety, distress, fretting, never, ever from God. Number two, 2 Timothy 1 says clearly, it clearly tells us that fear is a spiritual force. Invisible, but it's a deadly force. Number three, fear can take down the strongest person. It destroys large armies. The greatest of nations come down with fear. Number four, fear brings torment to the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. You know, 1 John 4, 18 describes it as the tormentor. Number five, if you don't deal with the root cause of the fear, the deception, the false belief, 
You will be coerced into making compromises. You'll even medicate to shut down the voices. And number six, God gives you and I a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, but we have to activate it. We can't be passive. We've got to activate it. And number seven, faith is the antithesis of fear. We quickly recognize a God thought because it inspires what? Power, love, and a sound mind. A sound mind is peaceful and courageous because it has faith in God. It's decisive. It sleeps restfully, not double-minded. It's a no-fear-here mindset because it's rooted in faith. Faith, faith. You can have that, my friend, but you have to root out the deceit, the demonic sleight of hand. Mark Twain, he said this, Courage is resistance to fear, mastery of love, not absence of fear. You know, I believe Mr. Twain is saying here, courage and faith is not the absence of the temptation to fear. Because even Jesus said, in this world, you will have trials, tribulations, but be of good cheer, he said, because I've overcome the world. You know, some of my Bible scholar friends right now are, are about to burst at the seams as they rightly ask, well, Pastor Stephen, what about the fear of the Lord? What about the fear of the Lord? Well, that is a great question. So let's address the English interpretation of this Hebrew terminology. It's Hebrew terminology, the fear of the Lord. This has everything to do with your perception, your focus. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, that's a good thing. You see, the English word fear in this verse is translated from Hebrew, giving us the full picture that you will either be in terror or reverence of the hand you see. That was the word that was used here for fear. If the hand you see is an enemy, you'll be scared, worried, anxious, yes, even in terror prompting a fight or flight response. If the hand you see coming is that of a protecting, providing, loving Heavenly Father, you'll be overwhelmed with awe and wonder. Amazement will overtake you and expectation for good. The hand of an enemy provokes an awful feeling. God's hand inspires an awesome feeling. So again, Fear comes from the Hebrew word meaning, the hand you see. That particular use of the English word fear in that verse, Psalm 111, comes from the Hebrew word meaning, the hand you see. It's either awful or awesome. It's either terrible or terrific. That's why a no fear here stance doesn't contradict the Hebrew term, the fear of the Lord, being a wonderful thing. What hand do you see coming in your life every day? When you lay your head down at night, what hand do you sense coming towards you? A hand to hurt or a hand to heal? A hand to pester, punch, and pound? Or God's hand that provides, protects, and promotes? Have you brought into the lie that God is secretly against you? Do you anticipate a hand of rejection or punishment from God? Do you think God backhands you? God's hand is stretched out to you with nail marks of redemption, pardon, mercy, help. Let's travel back in time to the Old Testament in 2 Kings, and let me tell you a true story, an amazing story. In the days of the prophet Elisha, the king of Syria was trying to make war against Israel. Every time Syria made a move, though, God would tell Elisha, the prophet, and he would advise the king of Israel. So the king of Syria decided he needed to capture this God spy prophet and shut down Israel's intel operation. So Mr. King of Syria sends his powerful army in the middle of the night to a town called Dothan, where the prophet is, and surrounds the city. Boom! Well, at least he thinks it's a big boom for the end of um, the prophet Elisha. But let's pick up the story here at 2 Kings chapter 6, starting at verse 15. The servant of the man of God got up early and went out, and behold, there was an army with horses and chariots encircling the city. Elisha's servant said to him, Oh no, my master, what are we to do? Verse 16, Elisha answered, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 
Verse 17, then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire surrounding Elisha. This is such a good story. God is always bigger and he's greater than your most terrifying enemy. But what do you see? What's your perception? And notice that last statement, the fire army of God was surrounding Elisha. It didn't say that it was surrounding the serpent, but Elisha. The servant got protected because he was with or associated with Elisha. Elisha was protected because he trusted in God. He believed on God. His faith was in God. He had a no fear here attitude because Elisha had a faith focus, a faith perception. Elisha's focus even protected the servant. Again, what hand do you see? What's your focus? Do you have a fear focus or a faith focus? Do you focus on the armies of the enemy or do you see the horses and chariots of God? God has already defeated your enemy at the cross of Calvary, but what do you see? Well, why am I struggling with fear then, Pastor Stephen? It's what you believe in. It's your focus. The servant of the prophet was gazing and focused on the natural. He could see, but he saw only the natural. Elisha was focused and looking to God's answer, the supernatural. It didn't mean that there wasn't an enemy. There's always an enemy, my friend. But God, don't tolerate fear. What you tolerate, you can't eliminate. No fear here is our stance. God never said there wasn't an enemy for you to be aware of. God never says deny reality. God is saying he will crush the enemy for you if you let him. How? Be in faith, not in fear. Be in faith. Remember, you have the power of choice and God doesn't mess with your power of choice. He will not. Think of the word fear as an acronym for falsehood eclipsing all reality. Let's face it, when you're in the grip of fear, all reality becomes distorted and skewed through the warped lens of that perception, doesn't it? This acronym will help you remember that fear, F-E-A-R, is rooted in deception, falsehood. It's not that the enemy doesn't have an army, but the eclipse occurs when his deception steals your focus and persuades you of his counterfeit, moreover, the reality of Christ's victory right? Fear doesn't stand a chance at the cross. That's the eternal, the actual reality. If you're struggling with fear, you're looking at the wrong hand. You've got room for more love. The enemy is a counterfeiter, so he comes at you with his awful hand. Not an awesome hand, an awful hand. God is always bigger and greater than your worst enemy. But like Elisha's servant, you've got to see God's hand. You've got to have your focus adjusted, your repetition set on God's hand, God's promises. Oh, come on, Pastor Stephen. Aren't we overreacting just a little bit about this whole thing? No, we're not. People commit suicide because they're tormented on the inside afraid, terrified of being alone. You might say, well, fear isn't so bad, is it? We all have fears, don't we? Well, that's a valid line of reasoning, but consider this. Sin did not keep the children of Israel out of the promised land. Fear did. Fear. Fear of the unknown. You can sin, you can make a mistake, but not have faith in it, belief in it. Fear is different though. You have to believe in it to activate it. Fearful leaders and bosses, they are insecure CEOs and they're usually tyrants. Fearful parents, they're often controlling, coercive, even abusive. Fearful friends are negative and often resort to manipulation, verbal coercion. Fearful automobile drivers are the most dangerous drivers on the road and my least favorite. 
fearful Christians are miserable people because they hold the cross of Christ in contempt of the victory of Jesus. It's like standing in a dark room with the switch in your hand. You authorize fear when you have every right in the name of Jesus to authorize his victory, his light. You misrepresent the power of God's word by allowing or authorizing fear. I know all about this because I've done it, my friend. I've believed more in my fear than in God's word or his promises. I have willingly tolerated fear in my life at times. And God cannot help me when I refuse to believe in him and instead authorize falsehood eclipsing all reality. Say that with me. Falsehood eclipsing all reality. The reality of the cross. We have to see it. We have to perceive it. But no more, my friends. We say no fear here in Jesus' name. Fear is enemy number one. And when I say fear, I'm talking about stress. I'm talking about worry, anxiety. Here's what the medical world says about fear, stress, and worry in your life. It negatively affects your sleep, your relationships, your digestion, your breathing, your blood pressure, you get skin rashes, cortisol level spikes, your brain function slows, then it becomes chronic and affects your decisions, your habits, your outlook, your weight, rationale, your effectiveness on the job or at school. You get panic attacks. Then it progresses into disorder, disease, depression, and even despairing of all life. My good friend, Dr. Don Colbert, he says that stress and fear do more to cause disease and sickness than even poor diet and lack of exercise. Fear kills from the inside out, but that's always been the enemy's tactic and battle strategy against you. He likes the whole Trojan horse thing, to get you to reverse your faith for what you don't want instead of for what you do want. Fear is incompatible with your design. Fear is incompatible with your design. Your design works great on faith, but it self-destructs on a diet of fear. Fear divides your house, your relationships, your marriage, you with your children. You know it's impossible for your body cells to fight against each other. The enemy wants you in self-destruct mode. Fear is critical to his strategy for that. Let's apply truth, God's love, to the top three tormentors of life. This is our practical application to deal with fear. Number one, the fear of death. It's probably the, the top fear of all. This is when a catastrophic mindset overtakes, masters and controls your thinking. This is the root of the enemy's lies that death is stronger than life. It thrives in the ignorance of God's truth, love, and his plans for your eternal life. Revelation 21, 4 says, God shall wipe away every tear and death shall be no more and no more pain. How about 2 Timothy 1, 10? Christ Jesus has abolished death and brought life and immortality. Well, then there's John 8, 51. Whoever keeps my word will never die. You see, you're born again for immortality. And that truth, that word of love is how we deal with the number one tormentor. Number two, the fear of failure. Oh, what a tormentor that is. Michael Jordan said this about his failure. He said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Oh, talk about dealing with the fear of failure, right? Failure is part of the process of getting to greatness. It's called trial and error. 1 John 5, 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Well, what about Philippians 4, verse 13? For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. John 1, 12, To as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the power and the right to be the children of God. This is the antidote to this fear. And then number three, the fear of being alone. This is a big tormentor. Loneliness, peer pressure, a sense of not belonging, the fear of not having approval lures people into bad relationships, lifestyles that they would never choose on their own. King Saul 
was supposed to be David's mentor, King Saul was about to fight the fierce Philistine army and he was losing popularity. His people were scattering from him. So motivated by fear of being left or being alone, he did what so many leaders do. He justified compromise and made the sacrifice that only Samuel the prophet was supposed to make. He made a sacrifice that was really an abomination to God. When you do something that seems right, but it's motivated by fear, you lose the war, my friend. You're basically saying, I care more about people leaving me than God leaving me. Trust God. Wait for God. Be patient. Don't get into an end justifies the means doctrine. It'll never work. Hebrews 13 verse 5, God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you or leave you. I will not in any degree leave you helpless or forsake you or let you down. Oh, talk about a word of truth, an antidote for your fear of being left alone, being alone. Faith talks, but fear talks, my friend. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Don't get me wrong. Faith is a million times, a million times, a million stronger than any fear, but fear is still toxic. It's a fake, it's a fraud. Have you ever seen those fake ducks or turkeys that hunters use? What do you think the purpose of those decoys are? That's right, so that the real turkey cozes up and then gets shot. <laughs> fear drops a word into your head. It becomes a mindset, a stronghold, a mental construct. Fear is more deadly than any disease known to mankind. It's the choice weapon of the dark forces of hell. And only the power of God can cast it down and destroy it. Personally, I've struggled with fear terribly in my life. Panic attacks. I had terrible anxiety growing up. I would have panic attacks. I remember as young as age six and seven, I would struggle with these panic attacks. I didn't even know what they were. I needed to protect myself. That's what I felt like. I had to protect myself. I began to make alliances and agreements with anger, control, futility, rage, sorrow. Through experience, circumstances, traumas, and hurts, we can react and default to wrong responses, wrong beliefs. And when you believe a lie, my friend, fear is ultimately the outcome. So what are you gonna do now? What will you do with this truth? Maybe you're saying to yourself, there's, there's just no way out. You may feel like, I, I might as well give up, I just can't do it. Your perception decides your fear or your faith, your curse or your courage. Let me say it another way. Your repetition decides your fear or your faith. Why? Well, because repetition creates persuasion. Whether it's through media, entertainment, advertisers know this well. Edwin Lewis Cole, great man of God, the late Edwin Lewis Cole said this, what you focus on the longest becomes the strongest. Remember, you have the power of choice over your focus. God's given that to you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, God said, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, and then he says this, you choose. You choose. So what hand are you looking at? What's your focus? Do you have an awful fear focus or an awesome faith focus? Why am I struggling with fear, Pastor Stephen? You, you may be asking right now, I just, why am I struggling with fear? It's what you're believing. It's what you're repeating over and over and it becomes what you believe. Repetition creates persuasion. It, does, it could be repeating the, a lie. It doesn't mean it's true, but it becomes your persuasion. Examine right now. With the Holy Spirit's help, examine your repetition. It doesn't mean there is not an enemy, but greater is he who lives in us than he that's in the world. Praise God. You know, God never said there wasn't an enemy for you to be aware of. Psalm 23 encourages reality. God says he will fight your enemies for you, but you have to authorize victory, the victory of faith. You see, enemies are opportunities for victory, but fear won't tell you that. 
Fear will never give you that kind of consulting. You have the power of choice and God will not mess with your power of choice. You choose your repetition and therefore you choose your persuasion. Persuaded of life or of death. Persuaded of blessing or of cursing. You can resist, cast down, and destroy the grip of fear in your life by bringing all of it to the cross of Christ. Jesus defeated the force of all fear at the cross with his love, with God's love. Do you want to do something about the fear and stress in your life? Bring it all to the cross. You can reject fear at the cross and receive all of God's love in that place at the cross. Jesus paid your fear bill, so to speak, your fear credit expense, but you have to receive it, my friend. Let's pray. Jesus, we submit to you. Just say that. Jesus, I submit to you. We confess and renounce all of our fear, worry, anxiety, and doubt here at the cross. If we've believed a lie, we lay it down and repent right now. You have triumphed over our enemies. We forsake all fear. Forgive us for ever doubting your promises, your faithfulness. And now, say that, say now, and now we receive your peace. Where there once was fear, we receive your love. Take all of our cares and worries. Jesus, you care for us. Jesus, you care for my family. Jesus, you care for me. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.